Welcome to the Work Hard, Play Hard podcast. My name is Rob Murgatroyd, and I'm a former doctor turned lifestyle entrepreneur. Each week, I interview some of the best minds on the planet on the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. Come take this journey with me. Excuses are over. It's time to live. I wasn't doing something or becoming somebody that I wasn't. I was truly authentically me and being able to just use my own look, my own hairstyle, my own beard style, and and just be me. And that was the most liberating thing, was just me being me and everybody wanted to get a piece of the action. After the fact, you're like, well, wow, now that I have done that or have achieved that or set out to do something like that, I'm like, really, that's it? So we've, we've got to do bigger things than that. Trends come and go, but style lasts forever. And I feel like that if it's something that I wore 20 years ago, but it was the right look and right fit, I could wear it today and still rock it. Okay, before we jump into this interview, I want to invite you to be considered for my 2019 Traveling Mastermind. So go to workhardplayhardmastermind.com and fill out the application and we'll jump on a call to see if you're a great fit. This year, we'll be in Boston doing lots of cool things like training with Tom Brady's trainer, Alex Guerrero. In the middle of the year, we'll be heading to Monaco doing things like vintage car rides through the French Riviera. And then we're going to wrap the year in Florence, Italy, doing things like truffle hunting and hot air ballooning over Florence. Look, Life is all about fulfillment, and I really try and walk the walk. So if you are looking to be part of our tribe of 28 high-achieving entrepreneurs that are in the six- and seven-figure range, fill out your application at workhardplayhardmastermind.com to be considered. So think of the mastermind as having two parts. The first is the trip itself. And the second part is what goes on over the four days within the mastermind. Our group of 28 entrepreneurs will help you brainstorm and accelerate what you want to achieve in 2019. And we'll do that through a variety of different exercises, brainstorming activities, breakout sessions, goal setting sessions, you know the drill. So go to workhardplayhardmastermind.com, fill out an application, and we'll jump on a call to see if you're a fit. All right, let's jump into today's episode. What's up, everybody? This is Rob Murgatroyd, and welcome to another episode of the Work Hard, Play Hard show. This episode features Stephen Atkins. You can find him on Instagram and elsewhere at atkins.steven. So who is Stephen? Stephen is an actor, model, fashion designer, and entrepreneur. I am obsessed with him. Okay. Part of this show is going to be a bit of a challenge because it's visual, right? He's a model, he's an actor, and it's hard for some of this to get across. So I did the best I could at asking questions in a way that would stimulate some visual thought. But to give you a picture, if you are driving, don't open Instagram. If you're not, open Instagram because it's definitely worth it to look at him. It's going to put a lot of this into context. So again, it's Adkins.Steven. So if you are driving, he looks like, you know, the most interesting man in the world, the Doseki guy on the uh, the beer commercials. He looks kind of like him. He has a incredibly interesting look. And he, I think he's up to like a quarter of a million followers now. So I'm not alone in my obsession with this guy. He has walked New York Fashion Week. He's a designer now. He's an entrepreneur. He's a dad. He has so many amazing things going on and he's incredibly humble. We talked about a bit of a military family background and we moved into how all of this developed over time and how he just sort of doubled down on his zone of genius. So there's so much to get into. I think what I'm gonna do is kind of get right into the episode with him. But a lot of people have been asking me about coaching. I'm working with a few select people um, who are ready to make a change in your life. So if that's you and you think I might be a good coach for you, go to workhardplayhardcoaching.com. Okay. Please enjoy this really interesting interview I had with Stephen Atkins. Stephen, welcome to the show. Hey, bud. Good to be here today. You know what, man? I am so 
freaking excited to do this interview. Um, but I'll tell you, man, this episode is going to be a challenge for me to do because the point I want to make here with you is a visual one. And for the people that are listening, <laughs> this is audio only. So here's yeah, what I'm man. going to encourage people to do. I'm going to encourage you, if you can, just pull over and go to Instagram and type in atkins.steven on Instagram. And you'll see what me and a quarter million other people discovered about this gentleman. And I'm going to do my best to kind of take a visual format <laughs> and move it into an audio format. So officially, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I'm, I'm really excited that uh, we have this opportunity. And uh, this is kind of a trend setting thing for you. If you're going to take a visual into an audio, man, this is awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, you know, <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to break it down into three parts. The show, as you know, is called Work Hard, Play Hard. So we're going to talk a little bit about work. We're going to talk a little bit about play, which really means fulfillment. And then we're going to wrap it up with some rapid fire questions. Cool. Sounds great, man. All right. So I think a good jumping off place to start would be with your dad, Chase. He was yeah. a, uh, a first lieutenant in the army. He uh, lived in Japan and was also in uh, the Air Force Motion Pictures Service. So can you describe in what ways that he influenced you to go to uh, Military Academy High School here in Georgia, where I am, um, and ultimately become a soldier for 10 years? And going into modeling and acting, because I see that he did something, I think, in the motion picture services actually in the military. So it's sort of interesting in doing my research on you to see that, you know, all of this has blended into what seems like your path. Yeah, I think uh, really with my father that uh, what he instilled in me, because him being a, you know, a sole proprietor, owned his own business, uh, learned so much about his life that you know, through uh, being in the military and uh, serving in Japan, which was just phenomenal to hear that story, uh, it, it really influenced me on a way of honestly dressing well. I know that sounds kind of odd, but he always dressed to the nines. And was always put together. And I think a lot of that had to deal with the structure of the military. Uh, he went to uh, Virginia Tech and was in the uh, Corps of Cadets there. So it was really interesting to see how that structure changed in his life. And that just influenced me in such a way that I enjoyed looking nice, being in the military. It just it just naturally flowed. You know, you grow up in that lifestyle. Uh, it just It just was an automatic really for me. You know, it's interesting. I've always wondered where the word dress to the nine comes from. So I'm going to have to figure that out. But what's interesting <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. is when we talk about dress to the nines, I just I just wikied it. And it says uh, it's an English idiom that means uh, dress to the highest degree, high class and perfection. And for those that have taken me up on my offer to scroll your Instagram, they'll see that that is really the standard that you live your life. So I want to dig in a little bit to your dad um, as it relates to that. So when you say like your dad dressed to the nine, like what do you, what do you mean by that? Was, was it like, you know, Tuesday afternoon and he had like a, like a neckerchief on, you know, or like, like, what was it? So it's really, it's really odd that I hardly ever saw my dad without a suit on. Even when he would go and cut the grass, he would have on a nicer pair of like, uh, not dress pants, but let's say a nice dress blue khakis and a nice button down shirt when he was cutting the grass. So it was, an, it was just this thing that he was always uh, in a nice suit or a shirt and tie. Uh, and I don't know if that was necessarily the profession, you know, he's a CPA. So he was always dealing with clientele and, and going around uh, in a lot of clubs and organizations, charitable organizations that he was a part of. Uh, but he was always, you know, always dressed really, really nicely. And I never saw him never wore like jeans, never wore like shorts or, or, cut off stuff or wife beaters or t-shirts. It was always dressed, uh, you know, appropriately or shown that he was uh, intent with how he was dressing. And he was always projecting himself in such a professional manner. So was it something that was unconscious for you? Because, you know, I, I have this, you know, again, like I said in the opening, it's a, it's a challenge because this is audio, but right. when I look at, 
you know, the kinds of things that you wear and we'll, we'll get into, you know, your runway work and, you know, your photo sure. shoots and modeling and yeah, all of that yeah. stuff. But when I, when I look at the things that you wear, I'm like, where does this come from? Where does this style come from? You know, if you put, you put a neckerchief, neckerchief on me or, or, or a purple sparkly thing on me, I look like one of the lollipop <laughs> kids from the Wizard of Oz, you know, but you, you do it. And so I look at it and I'm like, well, you know, he does it because he's got the, the salt and pepper thing. And I go, wait a minute. I got the salt and pepper thing. I got absolutely. Uh, I, I I got a, sil- a, a little mini, not like you, but I got a little mini silver fox. But so, so my question is like, where it's almost like the way you put it together is such beautiful art. And there's an element of it. I'll tell you something. I was in uh, Greece, and there's a, a guy that uh, I'll link up in the show notes that I met there. And he's, uh, he's not a model, but he's like a Russian influencer. And, he, and he's crazy about fashion, like obsessed with fashion. Like he'll, he'll drive to another country because they have more black, you know, like he's like looking for certain kinds of things. And so, you know, I asked him, I said, let's go out shopping. So he takes me out one night and I put it on and I was like, I feel like an idiot. He said, well, then you look like, a, <laughs> then you look like an idiot. He's like, you got to, you got to walk into this thing and you got to own it. So talk to me a little bit about that. Like, what is it, you know, when you jump into something, is there ever a moment where you're like, what the hell am I doing with this thing? Or do you, have you trained yourself to just naturally own it and rock it? So initially I own it. I basically, I use my, my, you know, somebody told me not that long ago that your eyes never deceive you. So what that means is like you you see a color that you tend to go towards or you see a pattern that you tend to go towards if your eye naturally always goes there there's a reason that you're that you have a you know inclination that that's something that I should have or I always felt like that if it was that aha moment or that wow moment when I saw a piece that I would definitely get it it's not mm, I've got to mull it over decide maybe I don't know what it look good no 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 if I see it and I'm like man I absolutely love that then I know that that's what I should be doing. I think to my style is kind of a, I call it a, a kind of a coin phrase, dressy messy. And what I mean by that is I love to take unique pieces that are, let's say a suit jacket or a shirt and tie and combine it with something that someone probably would never put it together with, like either a ripped up pair of jeans and loafers or a cool t shirt with a great pattern and put it with a suit. So I always try to try and, you know, different looks that I can put together that are unique. I think anybody can rock something if two things. One, if it's tailored to fit. You could have the most hideous looking shirt, but if it's tailored to fit, it's going to look awesome. And I think that's one of the main reasons why that I love fashion so much is because you can mix so many different looks, patterns, and styles. And if they're tailored fit and they fit you correctly, anybody can rock it. It's a lot of fun. Who do you look to for fashion? Who's your guy that you're like, this guy just, he, he just, he owns it. And and why do you look to him? That's a great question. And and honestly, bro, (laughs) I don't look to anybody. I define my own. I really don't. I might take inspiration. Meaning I'll look at uh, a couple of magazines or I'll look at a few Instagram accounts. I'm really not not too much into fashion trends as I am style because fashion comes and goes. Trends come and go, but style lasts forever. And I feel like that if it's something that I wore 20 years ago, but it was the right look and right fit, I could wear it today and still rock it. And I do. I have some clothes that are probably 20 years old. But because of taking care of them and they fit right, I can make it look relevant today. So honestly, there isn't in one person that I look to and say, that's someone I want to emulate. I'm looking at a wide variety of like 50 and just picking kind of grocery shopping. If that Has, makes sense. Yeah, it does. Has this been something that's always been, I know we talked about your dad, but has it been something yeah. that's always been in your DNA where, you know, like even in your 20s, you really cared about, you know, putting it together right? Absolutely. Um, and a lot of that came from my mother as well. Uh, she was a business professional. She actually worked with my father in the uh, firm. And by doing so, she always dressed really nicely in either business suits or nice dresses. Um, and she actually instilled a, quite a bit of, of uh, fashion sense to me growing up. 
um, believe it or not, until I was probably a teenager. Yeah, I'd say probably a teenager. She was buying and picking out my clothes for me. <laughs> yeah, but you don't even have like, like I wouldn't call you well dressed. I know that sounds weird, but I wouldn't call sure. you well dressed. I would, I would call you. I'm hesitant to say this because it sounds like I'm being a little bit, like I'm puffing you up too much. But it's almost like you're a style icon. Like you just. Like you just have a, such a unique way of putting things together. When I think of somebody who's well dressed, you know, I think of somebody that's wearing a suit and making sure that they have a collared right. shirt on, you know. But with you, it's like you're like truly out of a magazine. So I guess, I guess the question I have is you mentioned a couple of things I want to talk about. The first one is tailored fit. So you know, obviously when you're doing, you know, runways and, you know, photo shoots and things like that, you know, they're pinning it, they're making sure it's perfect for your body. But when it's Tuesday and, you know, you're going out to the Waffle House with your wife, you know, <laughs> how do you, what, like, what's that look like? So that would look like either a um, nice casual t-shirt, um, but I would make sure that it fit properly and then jeans. So a lot of times if I don't have Obviously, we, we would love to have that luxury of all the clothes that we wear on our runway, which are exactly, you know, to our exact measurements. Uh, that's not everyday life. However, if there's a lot of clothing that I buy off the shelf or that I will get, you know, at different retailers, I will have them, I'll take them to my local tailor and have them fitted to me a little bit better. So I will spend that little extra time and effort because it could, I could take a $20 pair of jeans and make them look like a $200 pair of jeans just because they're made to fit me. So in essence, yeah, I can wear the casual shorts and the button down and a pair of tennis shoes, but the shirt's going to fit me properly and the, and the shorts are going to fit me properly. I think a lot of times us as guys, we try to fit within, you know, just if it's a 32, 30, I'm going to go grab it off the shelf and that's what I'm going to wear because that's what my measurements are. But, but there's still a little give and take in areas that if it was adjusted, man, you'd look like a million bucks. And I think that's really the difference. So let's talk about that. You go to the tailor, yeah. you get a 30, yeah. you get a 3230. Yeah. And what are standard things when you go to the tailor? Do you say taper it down, you know, taper it down the leg, make, you know, make sure that it goes above my ankle because I want this to have a cropped look. Do you mess with the t-shirts at all? Because every time I've ever tried to do something like that, it's never come back right. I don't know if I have the wrong tailor, if I'm given the wrong recommendations or things, you know, right. like you should right. just, I should just buy them right the first time. Talk to me a little about that. Sure. Absolutely. For the pants, for sure. Absolutely. is taper the leg a um, little bit looser in the thigh. And I'd like for it to taper down towards the calf, not too tight and take a little bit off. So it is a little more cropped and check the seat. A lot of times when you sit down in pants, it's typically in the thighs and the seat uh, where issues are. You could have, and I learned this from one of my tailor friends that he was saying, it really doesn't matter what the waistline is. If it's loose, we can always adjust that. It's all about the seat. So your rear end and your front of your thighs, when you sit down, you want to make sure that it's comfortable and they can always take it in around the waist. So sometimes the 3230 it might need to be like a 3430 so that we can get the seat right and then they can bring the waist into a 32. So it's sometimes just adjusting a little bit like that. Also, a tailor. Oh man, the right tailor is you're exactly right. It's almost like the right barber. I've got one guy that cuts my hair and beard and I hardly let anybody else touch it because he knows and finding that tailor so when I do one or two or three or 12 things, they know exactly when I come in that they they've cut and it fits to measure me individually. T-shirts, it's really, uh, you know, small to medium. And that's just a matter of trying them on. So I'm, I'm always like taking the packages and undoing them or going into the dressing rooms and trying them on because one brand might be a medium, one brand might be a small, one brand might be a large. And it's just a matter of the, of the fit. You want that triangle fit to where it kind of hugs more into the waist and a little bit wider on the chest. And it's really just a matter of fit and find uh, some... I've tried at retailers and I absolutely love and I'll get the same size in another one. And I'm like, okay, this is now going to turn into a rag. There's just no way. So, so the triangle fit means that it's, it's, it's tighter in the shoulders and tighter in the waist and it's not hanging on you like a, like a box. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's not so easy. Sometimes, to, not so easy to find yeah. those. You're right, man. You're right. And sometimes you have to kind of take the t-shirt in. 
get a larger one and have them kind of snip it. They can actually re sew the seams on the side and taper it in a little bit. I know it's a t-shirt, but again, it's all about the fit. Again, is it worth, you know, you can buy a hundred dollar t-shirt and it looked like crap, or I can go buy a 10, $20 t-shirt and have it tailored fit. And I'm like, man, it looks so good. And it, and it fits in the right places. It's really a matter of adjust. And that's the thing in fashion and in, in uh, clothing, it is made to fit everybody, but it's not made to fit you. So it's always a matter of trying to get it to fit you individually. And that's what I love so much about it, about Taylor Fit, is that I can adjust any of my wardrobe, any of my outfits to fit me, but it won't fit the guy right beside me because it's made specifically for me. So you're willing to, you know, buy a t-shirt for 10 or 20 bucks and throw another 20 or 30 bucks to have it tapered so that it looks right. Even if it, even if it costs more than, than the thing bought in the first place, right? Absolutely. Because it's going to look like it was made for me. And, and I know some people may not agree with that, but at the same time, I will have 10 of those or five of those, and I will have them for an extended period of time uh, and, and buying better material. So it'll hold up, but naturally doing that. Oh yeah. I won't have to buy them for, you know, a long time. All right. I want to talk about your look a little bit. You've got a um, Dosecki most interesting guy in the world <laughs> look, right? Like that's your vibe. You got that. You got that. Never, thing. never heard that before. I can only imagine, right? So <laughs> you got that thing. That's who you. That's who you look like. I don't know one other person that looks like you. So I don't know what what else to call you. You know, it's it's you, it's just this kind of look that when you look at you you're like, I got to talk to this guy. Does he, is he a real person? Does he really talk and move? You know, like, <laughs> like he's just got this, you know, clearly one in a billion look. How much of that look was crafted to create a persona versus, hmm, I just want to wear my, my hair and my beard this way. Long story short, or we do a short story long. Yeah. What, this was about two, maybe three years ago where I just decided to grow out my beard. I was seeing the, the, the beard thing with guys was so cool when everybody was doing it. And I was like, man, you know what? It'd be cool to just give it a shot. Um, and so I grew that I grew it out and it was that wow moment because the coloring and the way that it came in, I was like, wow, this is pretty stinking cool. Uh, wasn't anything that I adjusted or wasn't like I put any color in it or anything. And once I had grown it out for about six months or so, and then I started trimming it and kind of get it into a form or fashion, all of a sudden, like people started telling me, dude, you've got to do something. Like you've got to either get photos or model or do something because your look is so cool. Uh, I love it. And so from that point, you know, really just growing out the beard, then I just started saying, okay, this might be something that I can you know, something I can do with this. Uh, let me, let me start reaching out to some folks and, and let's create an Instagram account. Let's create a, a persona and, and run with it. So from that point in the specifics, when I grew out my beard, the first thing that happened, there was a beard grooming products company that saw a couple of my posts and they had this open call that they were looking for new models. And I sent them my information and they replied back and they're like, dude, we've, you've got to come work for us. You've got to come do some work for us. So I flew down to where they were and, and uh, did the photo shoot. And then they started using me on their social media and their website. And then all of a sudden, my personal stuff started getting traction because of it. And then just, I mean, literally the firestorm started. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable how fast and how quickly the look took off and how many people were interested in it. And, you know, the great thing about it, this was what's really cool for me is that I wasn't doing something or becoming somebody that I wasn't. I was truly authentically me and being able to just use my own look, my own hairstyle, my own beard style and, and just be me. And that was the most liberating thing was just me being me and everybody wanted to get a piece of the action. So that was, that was like, this is too good to be true. Are you serious? Well, this is what's so interesting to me. You know, you've got 215,000 people. <laughs> like that is, you, you, that's like the country of Mongolia. You know, it's unbelievable how many people follow you. And I, I you know, I, 
What I'm trying to figure out is when I scroll my Instagram and I see you, I stop. And I want to look, where, where is this guy today? Like, is he on television? Is he on the runway? Is he in New York <laughs> Fashion Week? You know, how does he make this picture look so good? How is he posed? Like, there's something inside of me that goes like, hey, I'm attracted to this guy. This guy's just a cool dude. And I don't think I do that really with many other people. So I guess the question I have for you is, actually, there's a few questions. The first one is, who is the demo? I, like I just described me, but who is the demo? Who's the 215,000 people that are wanting to follow you? What is it? It's not like you're writing poetry. It's not like you're given, you know, the secret to cure cancer. You're right. just posing a picture of you in a cool outfit. Why yeah. do you think a quarter of a, mi a million people and growing rapidly want to be a part of your world? What is it? I think it's the authenticity. Uh, I also think that it is the uh, um, approachableness. Like I, I strive to interact. Like I, I love to connect with people. So any event that I'm with or anything that I'm involved with, I'm talking and networking with everyone. If people send me messages or if people comment on my stuff, I am always replying, always interacting and I think that it's, it looks like, okay, here's this guy that, you know, and, and it's taken a lot of work to achieve what you're saying where I'm at. Naturally, this didn't happen overnight. A lot of study, a lot of going through the right photographers, a lot of, a lot of uh, staging going involved that I wanted to make sure because I'm at the point now that the quality of the content that I put out is going to be like 10 on 10 scale. Like I can't mess around, um, not only because of myself, but other brands that I now represent or things that I'm involved with. But I believe that it's the authenticity. It's the, wow, if this guy can pull it off, so can I. That's what I, that was really my mission in doing this is that here's an average guy that started, you know, we haven't really talked about like what I did prior to and where I am now. But in essence, it's a blue collar guy that started with a dream and basically an idea and then has just kind of catapulted into realms that I never would have thought were even possible. And it's just, I want to bring as many with me. In other words, like, you know, the, the tide raises all boats. So I want to be, a, you know, that swelling tide that help as many people, uh, encourage as many people, show them what's possible, that you can, you know, stick with it. Uh, and it's not going to happen overnight. You're going to have to put in some long hours and hard work and determination and get nothing in return for six months. But then all of a sudden you start to see that trickle that that's really what it is. It's the fact that I want to be approachable, show what's possible and the authenticity. All right. So let's, let's talk about that. Let's kind of go backwards a little bit. <clears throat> sure. Let's talk about you and I met at a, uh, a network marketing event. We're both in the same network marketing company. And yes. at that time you were working, I think maybe a, like a remodeling business or something like that. Yeah. What does the trajectory look like for you from, you know, what you just described as, you know, the blue collar guy who has an idea to this thing blowing up? Like kind of walk me through a little bit of what that timeline looks like. I own a uh, painting power washing business and have done that for close to 18 years now, which is hard to believe that it's been that long. And, uh, and, and I based that on, you know, the fact that my father was a business owner, so I saw the big advantage of being a business owner and working for yourself. Uh, there's great risk, but great reward as well. So I was all about, let's, let's open a business and let's crush it. Now, what's really cool is that I am, you know, with this new modeling side, you know, other work that I'm doing, I really want that to be my full-time career. So in essence, there for a while, you're doing both. So here is this guy that is one day had to go out and paint a bedroom from a client. And then the next weekend, you're in New York Fashion Week walking the runway. <laughs> so the, the paradigm there is just insane at times. And I fought against it for a long, long time. Uh, I struggled, meaning I wanted to focus so much on uh, growing my personal brand, growing the, the, the fashion, the modeling, the acting, all kinds of stuff like that. 
And I'm like, the heck with this other thing, man. I don't want that. I don't want to have anything to do with that anymore. It's, that's not who I am. And for probably the first year, year and a half, I really struggled with trying to uh, maintain both. And, and the personal business struggled for a while because it was, didn't have my attention and didn't have my time. And then I had to come to this kind of an epiphany that, you know what, I, I, in order for me to still pay the bills, still take care of the family, still make ends meet, I've got to continue doing this contracting business. And I've got to use that as a platform for my family until the other one gets to a point where it supplements. So that was you know, a, a big moment for me that I'm like, it's okay that right now, I've got to go and sling the paintbrush or spray the power washer this week. And then next week, I'm going to fly out and we're going to go to New York or we're going to go to Philadelphia or we're going to go to Miami Beach and we're going to do our modeling shoot runway looking, you know, dressed to the nines. So that was a... This is such an interesting story. Do you know who Rich Roll is? Have you ever heard of this guy? He's a podcaster. Uh, He's a great, great, great podcaster. And he was sort of blowing up with his podcast um, right around uh, the time where everything in his life was going to shit. And so he was having like his cars repoed and his book came out and his book <laughs> went to number one and they were repoing right. his cars. Right, and right. the point is that there is a lag time that sometimes I think crosses over between what you're currently doing and what you want to be doing. And sometimes, you know, in my case, you know, I wanted to be doing podcasts full-time, masterminds full-time, et cetera. But like you, I still had to make the ends meet. So I was still working as a chiropractor. I was still running the business. So I was having to do both of them simultaneously. And like you, I was super frustrated about it. So you know, I, I think the lesson for the people that are listening now is to understand that when you're going from one thing into another thing, that it may not happen exactly the way you want it to happen and know that that lag time is going to be there. Is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. And honestly, what really was inspiring to me is knowing that there are others that are going through it. And I, and I liken that to even like you and your situation, it was an inspiration to me, like some of the feelings that I'm feeling, some of the frustrations that I'm having, I feel like, you know, am I being inauthentic because I am living two worlds, which was crazy. And then uh, I'm like, gosh, what do I do with all of this? Like, I, I just, um, I feel like I'm using both sides of my brain at the exact same time. And you feel like you get on overload sometimes. But surrounding myself with the right people, listening to the right things, reading the right things really helped me to realize, okay, this is normal, it may not be normal to everyone else. And this is not like a conversation I can go and have with everybody because they'll be like, you're, you're stupid. What are you doing? But the right people in the right place uh, will encourage you and say, hey, man, everything you're going through, totally been there, done that, and it's okay. Uh, but you're also going to have to, you're also going to have to learn to shuffle and do both. And I think that was my biggest struggle was learning how to do both. But now I finally settled it to where I know, you know, I can flip the switch on and off as needed. And I know that there's, I know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. That's I'm, the thing. I know there's light at the end of the tunnel. I want to talk to you a little bit about vanity, right? I'm a pretty vain guy. As you, uh, <laughs> as you get older, you know, right now you're rocking this thing because you got the salt and pepper yeah. thing. Yep. But, you know, we're not living forever, right? You know, um, our man. body changes, our hair color changes, our beard color changes, you know, et cetera. How much of that is a concern for you? Not at all. And I tell you why, bro. Oh, and I will put a little segue in there that uh, I'm like you. I've got to have my hair gel and my hair done, man. It's just the way it is, bro. <laughs> I can't I can't go out of the house without my stuff done. I'm sorry. It's just the way that I am. I it is what it is. Here's a great caveat to that. The most interesting man in the world, he's close to 80 years old, if not already 80 years old. Oh, wow. What a great person to look up to. See? So I'm like, it doesn't matter to me. I'm I'm 40, soon to be 44. And I'm like, man, I'm still going to be rocking the look when I'm 75 or 80. It's no problem. I, I will embrace the changes because even when the changes happen, either it's physically or I lose the black in my beard and it turns all to gray, they, Guess what? Me being who I am, I'm going to embrace that and I'm still going to walk 
with that confidence and still be out there crushing it and still be out there setting trends and doing it. So it's, I, I look forward to it actually. I love that. All right. So I want to move into uh, the art of fulfillment portion of the show and talk about some things that you do to improve areas that are outside of fashion um, and outside of remodeling, et cetera. Are there any positions or opinions in the last few years, or it could be way back. It doesn't have to be in the last few years that you changed your mind substantially about where you were like, I used to think this, but now I think that what comes to mind for you? I would say uh, recently, I'd say within the last few years, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Chris Harder, for sure. Mm. Mindset on money. Uh, that, that right there, it is okay to want to pursue wealth and to go out there and absolutely crush it because with that great wealth, man, I can do some amazing things because I have a lot of like charitable organization and things that are near and dear to my heart that I want to just absolutely blow them up. And in order to do that, you need resources. So I'm like, man, I want to find a way to turn everything about me. And I don't mean that in a conceited way, but I want to find a way to turn everything about me into a money-making machine. And I'm like, it is okay. It's almost like my responsibility to do that. So I would definitely say Chris Harder. Was there sort of a uh, money mindset issue for you growing up where you felt like if you made a bunch of money that, you know, you were one of those people? Did that ever come to, uh, you know, was that a part of your your DNA that you had to overcome? Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, a little bit um, on the flip side, though, it was uh, as a uh, my father being a sole pr- practitioner, you know, he was a, a smaller firm and it was always uh, he had to work extremely hard and a lot of hours uh, to make ends meet for you know, obviously paying payroll and paying for the business and then running the family and all those types of things. So it wasn't a huge abundance mindset. It was a, a mindset of just enough to make things, you know, taken care of. Uh, We didn't want for anything. I don't mean it like that, but it wasn't like, you know, a lot of saving, a lot of retirement uh, of things of that nature. So it was really just kind of work week to week and do the best you can. And, and, you know, when's the next deadline coming so that we can, you know, make enough money to do all that we need to do there. So it was, it was really, I looked at it like you had to work really hard, but you didn't make a whole, whole lot in doing it. And now I'm like, well, we can work smarter or find, you know, you can't put all your, I think what it is, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. That, that's what it is. I think it was back then, it was all the efforts were put into one thing and you got one return. Uh, so the mindset had to change for me of let's find a way to spread it around so that you can have multiple things working for you that you don't have to work so hard. At one. Love that. What is a goal that you thought when you achieved it, everything's going to be great. When I have this goal, my life is going to be perfect. And then you achieve it and you're like, "Ah, that just didn't give me what I wanted. Does anything like that come to mind for you? Walking New York's Fashion Week. Oh, tell me me about that. Because I would have thought that a guy in your shoes, pun intended, would have been like, this is the most unbelievable thing I've ever done in my life. What, what, why was it not all it was cracked up to be? It was something that happened that I wasn't anticipating. So literally my first trip ever, my wife and I were able to go, my first trip ever to New York City was to walk in New York's Fashion Week. So that's a pretty cool story, actually, to be able to say that I've never even been to New York and the first time I went, that that was my reasoning behind going. Going and doing it, it was fantastic. I mean, I loved it, uh, made great connections. But then after the fact, you're like, well, wow, now that I have done that or have achieved that or set out to do something like that, I'm like, really, that's it? So we, we've got to do bigger things than that. So it was just really you put it up on this pedestal. And then once you kind of go through it and then afterwards, you're like, wow, because it doesn't stick around. I mean, it's once the week is done and you do the walk and you're over with and everybody packs up and comes back home, you really don't have too much of a tangible asset to hold on to after that. You've got the experience, but I'm like, wow, we need need something a little more concrete than that. What does it feel like when you're backstage getting ready to walk out? Are you nervous? Not nervous, but I love watching the absolute chaos. (laughs) In what what way? 
It is ridiculous. Okay, so behind the scenes, you've got the designer who's who acts like they're they're like a chicken with their head cut off mm-hmm. because they they want to make it look the best. So they're running around, and you've got all the models that are getting in their outfits. And then you've got the, the designers going and adjusting each outfit and looking at it. And you've got the music playing in the background with the DJ setting up the runway floor. And then you've got some of the back behind the scene photographers that are taking some photos. And then there's people back there, you know, where are my shoes or where's the shirt that's supposed to go with these pants or, Oh crap, where's the belt. And it's just, it's hilarious because they, tr- it's, you know, it's the calm before the storm. And everything looks great on the other side of the curtain, but behind the veil, man, it's it's people running around, going crazy, throwing stuff all over the place, trying stuff on. It, it's it's hilarious and awesome all at the same time. So it's basically Instagram in real life. You know, I live <laughs> I live in, I live in a uh, in a, a high rise in uh, Buckhead in Atlanta, and it's a really beautiful. Uh, they call it the streets of Buckhead. It's this really beautiful area, and so you know everybody. Not everybody, but a lot of people are walking around take, with professional photographers taking photos uh, for Instagram. And, you know, I see these girls and guys and they're, you know, going through 8,000 gyrations, moving their hat, hon- holding their ponytail, fixing their, <laughs> fixing their shorts, the whole thing. And then, yeah. you know, this beautiful shot. And I'm like, if anybody knew what six seconds before this picture looked like. (laughs) So true. (laughs) So true. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) Right. Uh, Bro, bro, you are preaching to the choir. It's hilarious. Like some of the one, like even some of the shots that I've done, uh, where one where I'm sitting in a chair and there's like the playing cards kind of doing this orbit around me. Uh, That right there, like two seconds before that, uh, you know, we were practicing and threw up like the 52 cards and they all land like right on top of my head and like scratching down my face and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, if they had just seen like two seconds before how ridiculous it is to try to do this, uh, it's so true. But you know what I think is, I think it's good to actually talk about this because, you know, we're living in a world right now where with things like Instagram, we look at everybody else's life through whatever, whatever highlight reel they want us to see. And we think that our life is less than because of the illusion that we see, you know, with these people. And I'll tell you, you know, I've had the privilege of being around some pretty high level people. There's no difference. They're exactly the same as everybody else. There's no difference. You know, sometimes I come away from meeting with them and go, oh my God, what I thought this person was like, holy shit. Right. Like, I, I love this person. What happened? I saw the chink in the armor. You know what I mean? So, sure, sure. So a couple of questions on fulfillment. If you could spend one month anywhere in the world, where would it be oh, and why? I was ready for this question, man. I love this question. So I would spend it in Naples, Italy. Mm. We had, man, I love Italy, bro. My wife and I had the opportunity to visit Naples a couple of years ago. Uh, just that was the town that we decided to visit out of all of everywhere. We we're like, we want to be near the water. We want to be into more of the authentic side of Italy where it's not so much tourism as per se. And just absolutely loved it. I mean, if if I could find a way to live there, I would live there without question. So such an interesting thing for you to say. I have a million comments on that, but my, uh, my, yes. my mother, her name is, uh, her maiden name is Cecilia DeVito and her mom was raised in Naples and wow. we, we got married, my wife and I, uh, in Amalfi. So we, you, you know, when you get married, you got to go to Naples and take a boat, which is just, you know, 15 minutes away into Amalfi. And it's, uh, it's like a treasure hunt when you, when you get married in Italy, you got to go, we had to get this thing called the Marco de Bolo. And, you know, so we go into the, uh, we go into the place to find out, you know, how we register for the marriage license. And we walk into this, you know, this place and there's a computer sitting on this guy's desk and it's got a cover over it. And he says, I got to enter your name in the book. And I was like, do you use a computer? And he looks at it and he says, you know, I'm broken Italian. I don't trust that thing. <laughs> So he pulls, <laughs> he pulls, a, he pulls his book. It looks like Snow White, right? It was like, you know, a, a, it was like 10 feet 
hi. And he opens it up and he hand writes our name in it. I was like, okay, so can we get married now? He's like, no, 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 you gotta, now you gotta go to a tobacco store and you gotta get a sticker in the tobacco store. It's called the Mark I of the Bolo. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. And then you gotta post on the first Tuesday of the month in a certain church, you got to let the town know that you, it was, it was insane. It was absolutely insane. It was maddening, but you're right. There's something magical about that place. I don't know what the hell it is, um, but there's just I something. I would love magical. to have gone through that experience. Oh, it was, it was that, absolutely that incredible. incredible. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. incredible. In fact, we're, uh, I don't know if you know this, but we're, we're leaving Atlanta in 30 days and we're spending uh, four months in Europe. Two of them are going to be in, uh, are in uh, Italy. Uh, we got six weeks in uh, Florence and two weeks in Rome. So uh, I can fold up real small and fit in your suitcase. <laughs> we're excited. We're excited. And then we're moving to our, our new home in California. What is the thing that's rocking your world right now that has nothing to do with work? That's man, that's a great question. Nothing to do with work because mm -hmm. everything that I'm so excited about right now has to do with work. Look, here's the thing. I'm, uh, I'm going to buy you a little time to think about this. Most of the people that I work with, whether I'm coaching with them or they're a part of my mastermind or they're guests on the podcast, they all have the same thing in common. They're either in one of two, one of two categories. One category is I'm doing something I want to get out of, kind of like you are, you know, in some ways, and they're on different levels of that. And then the other, the other side of it is they love what they do so much that they don't really have a whole lot of other interests in other areas because they're yeah. passionate about it. And the problem is you could become very one dimensional if you stay so focused on the thing that you love the most and you start, you know, you start not doing other things, which is why I forced them, you know, on my, I'm taking, I'm taking 20 knuckleheads with me to the South of France to do, uh, there you go. to do a bunch of fun things because they love what they do so much. I can't tear them away from it. So is there anything right, in your right. life that kind of comes to mind that, you know, maybe I'll ask the question a little differently. Is there something that you've, you know, really wanted to learn or do, but for one reason or another, because of work, you just haven't gotten around to yet. Oh, okay. There you go. I would love to learn how to surf. There you go, buddy. That's it, man. Okay. And, and we're only, we're only two hours away from the beach. And I'm like, man, I would love to spend two weeks and just learn to surf. Well, you know what? That is, um, I visualize every morning me surfing in California in our new location. So, um, so anytime you want, you and your wife come out to California and we'll, uh, We'll go surfing. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but we can go out to sure. California and just figure it out together. Two I, guys that don't know how to surf will be awesome, man. I mean, I, you, listen, <laughs> I, I don't know that the, with the amount of hair products we have, I don't know that they're going to let us right. in the ocean. I mean, we're going to cause we a- Hey, we wouldn't need a life preserver. The hair product would keep us <laughs> All right, so I want to wrap up with our rapid fire round. Answer as quickly or as slowly as you like. It's the first thing that comes to mind round. What would your friends say is one of your superpowers? That uh, without question, uh, making people laugh with my wit. What's one of the things you're afraid yeah. of right now? Not being able to spend enough time with my daughters. Mm. God, I feel that one too. What keeps you up at night? Getting my clothing line off the ground. What do people never ask you, but you wish they did? Where did you meet your wife? Okay, where did you meet your wife? Now I got to ask. <laughs> so we're both musicians. We didn't even talk about that part, but we, she, we met at a music conference. Uh, she was there performing and the band that I used to play in was invited to perform. Uh, so we met, this was like before American Idol was even a thing. This was back in the early 2001. Uh, so we were there kind of critiquing one another in their acts, talking about how they could make it in the music industry and some tips and pointers. So each act would kind of judge the other act. So she was there at the conference and I saw her and I'm like, man, you're talking about like fireworks, love at first sight. It was totally that. So my first words were when we sat down to her, uh, we each had papers that we were judging each of the other acts that were performing. And my first words to her was, I wanted to cheat off of your paper. <laughs> what is, what is, what does she, um, play and what do you play? Or is she just a singer? Uh, sure. She is a full-time singer. She actually is the uh, music director, uh, for our church and the worship leader. So she has been a singer pretty much her entire life. Uh, and I was a drummer in a rock and roll band. So I played the drums for about 30 years now. 
Amazing. And you yeah. also, um, you also have one of those voices. I mean, you and I, you and I have, uh, the, the one things that we have in common are voice and hair, right? So for yes. you, um, yes. how did you step into the world of, uh, voiceovers? I forgot to ask you that. That was created by me calling into a radio show of all things. They had a contest on a radio show that I happened to know the answer. And so by chance I was able to get through and the DJ was like, has anyone ever told you that you have an amazing radio voice? And I'm like, oh, come on, you're crazy. No, like, no, seriously. So from that stepping off point, uh, they pretty much got me in touch with a few other people. And then I actually took vocal training and took a course and all these types of things and do voiceover work now. So it's one of those little side hustle gigs that I enjoy doing that everything from clothing lines to you know, construction to a television commercial to whatever, doesn't matter. There's times where, or even for a grocery store, I just did one a few months back for a grocery store. So it's been really cool to kind of use that vein as just something fun to do. So, you know, as, is, as always like. What does voiceover work look like? I never really understood that. Do they just send you a book to read for like Audible or like, give me an example of that. For me specifically, um, I actually Googled to find a, a vocal coach, which like, which if you're doing voiceover work, why would you need a vocal coach? But in reality, just as much as a singer needs a coach, you know, a voice artist needs a coach as well. And it was an actual course that I would go to in a classroom setting and go and, and learn to how to read and then fluctuate in the right way, how to change the voices, how to learn how to do, you know, find character voices within your head and be able to project those, um, do more editorial, do more narrative. It's really interesting that there's so many different diversities of voice work that you can do. Uh, getting scripts, practicing, breathing techniques. It's, it's almost ridiculous as to how much the time and effort that you can put into it to really perfect the craft and then use that, you know, use that in some form or fashion. So what it was really a-, a What are some of the things that you've thing. done though? Let's see. One of them was, uh, let's see, several grocery stores where they would have uh, advertisements for, you know, miscellaneous products. Um, oh, so you'll just say today at uh, Shopwell, there's, you know, $1.99 yeah, 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 apples. Yeah. Okay, yeah. got it. That's interesting. Yeah. There's there's a guy named Roger Love. Did you ever hear of him? He's, um, he's, uh, sounds familiar. he's probably the most famous voiceover guy uh, out there. I want to get him for the podcast. He works with... Uh, he works with a lot of the American Idol singers and he works with uh, Tony Robbins uh, trying to save his uh, trying to save his voice and Tony Robbins had him on his podcast once so he's got a book he's got a book out about it that you may uh, that you may love but uh, I love Yeah, we'll definitely check that out. Yeah, uh, yeah. What is your guilty pleasure? Oh man. I love to play cornhole. Cornhole, huh? <laughs> yes. Like the beanbag toss game? Yes. Bro, oh, I just stink and love to do it. It's my competitive edge. Like I just, I'm so competitive in anything that I do. I will, I will fight to the death. And I, you know, it's great at times, <laughs> but even on something like that, I, I love the concentration on that. And it's so much fun. I know it's, it's just a silly, you know, uh, barbecue tailgating type thing, but man, you, you put me in the zone. I stink and love that game. It may, absolutely amazing. So let's wrap up with talking about your clothing line. How did this yeah. clothing line come to be and who's it for? Absolutely. So it came to be um, by someone reaching out uh, to me through Instagram. And uh, they were naturally, which was interesting because this was last year. And I just didn't feel prompted to you know, respond. I didn't know really what they were looking for at the time. And it just didn't have the interest. And then this year, uh, earlier this year, just on a whim, I decided to reach out and, and talk to the individual that worked for the company uh, that wanted to just kind of connect, get together. And so when we got together, the timing was right for them and the timing is right for me. Uh, and the name of the company is Alton Lane. And what Alton Lane does is they are a custom fit men's clothing line. So they do shirts, blazers, trousers, shoes, pretty much, you know, from a suit look to a wedding look to the casual look, however you want to do it. Uh, and it just really, they wanted to collaborate and bring me on as a partner to be a guest designer. 
And by doing such, they're allowing me to create my entire clothing line from scratch, pretty much design from the looks and the feels. And, and we're going to roll it out here uh, in the first week of June. Um, so, I mean, needless to say, I'm thrilled to death about that because this is something where not only am I getting the ability to design, but I'm going to be wearing my own clothes, which, I mean, come on, who wouldn't want to do that? Look at you. Look at you. Look at what you've created this last, God, just less, this last year, right? I mean, do you, pin, yeah, do you pinch yeah. yourself and say, honey, I'm a big shot. Do you know who you're sleeping next to at night? I'm a big shot. Is she impressed? Um, she, <laughs> she keeps me level-headed. Thank the Lord. Um, she's extremely impressed. She was like, you know, it's funny at times she'll talk to people. She's like, who did I marry? Like, who, who is this guy? Where did this come from? And you know, you're in the right vein because when things just naturally fall into place and you're not even, there's no way I could have orchestrated any of this. So, you know, you're doing what you should be doing. The more it just keeps piling on and piling on and piling on. And even with the, what's really unique is that within the next, I think 30 to 60 days, I'm going to be landing my first magazine cover. And they're doing a feature article within the magazine. And guess what? I get to wear my clothing line on the cover of the magazine. So how cool is that? So it's boom. Just, boom. Unbelievable. Well, listen, this has been um, a really quick hour. I am super grateful that you took the time. I know you've got a lot of things that are happening. And it really meant a lot to me that you found the time for this. Do you have any final words, suggestions, or an ask for the people that are listening? Yeah, I would just say uh, definitely to um, follow me on Instagram, uh, atkins.steven for sure. Be on the lookout. Uh, there's an invita open invitation that we have uh, for my clothing line. I get to go on a little tour around the country to a few key locations, uh, New York, Chicago, and Nashville, and in Richmond uh, for the headquarters. And it's open for anyone to attend. They can come and, and uh, meet and see the clothing line and hang out. It's a great place for connecting. Uh, so all the dates, locations, and whatnot are as well on my, my Instagram. So it'd be great uh, if they did that. Well, dude, thank you again. And I will be following like a little fanboy everything that you are doing. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, brother. All right. Thanks for listening. If you love this episode and you know someone that needs some help in either stepping up their work hard game or their play hard game, it would mean the world to me if you shared this podcast with them to help me get this movement out there. So if you like what you heard, head on over to iTunes, take 30 seconds and leave me a five star review and I will be forever grateful. So until the next episode, excuses are over. It's time to live. We'll be right back. 